Up, we have, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Paul Levinson. He is a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University in New York City. His science fiction novels include The Silk Code, winner of the Locus Award for Best Science Fiction Novel of 1999, Borrowed Tides, The Consciousness Plague, The Pixel Eye, The Plot to Save Socrates, Unburning Alexandria, and Chronica. His nonfiction books, including The Soft Edge, Diddle, D Digital McLuhan, Real Space, Cell Phone, and New New Media have been translated into 12 languages. He appears on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, the History Channel, and NPR. He edited Touching the Face of the Cosmos on the Intersection of Space Travel and Religion with Michael Voltmate. Dr. Levinson, you're... Well, thank you. I hate to uh, interrupt that. It was such a good introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've been thinking about the space program for a long time, as I'm sure all of you have. And in particular, uh, after the great days and accomplishments of the 1960s, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, why haven't we done more? And, you know, there are many explanations. Richard Nixon maybe is one. <laughs> but I, I don't want to get into too much politics. What I did do is examine what the prime motivations uh, for our species have been to get off this earth. And, you know, as most of you know, the, the first real accomplishments in getting off the Earth, beyond the Earth, uh, happened in a military situation. So apropos of uh, Michael, who will be talking to you soon, the Germans deserve an enormous amount of credit, even though it was used for bad purposes, for really getting rocketry to the point where it could lift things off this planet. And then that military motive continued uh, after the end of World War II. It continued in the Cold War between the US and, and the former Soviet Union. Uh, and that actually is what bore the fruit of the late 1960s, where you have somebody walking on the moon. And actually, you have more than somebody walking on the moon. You have more than one human being walking on the moon. And then it pretty much stopped. Obviously, we've gone out into space. We obviously have a, you know, a robust program in many ways. But back in 1969, if somebody had asked me where we would be in 2016, I would have said, hey, we'd have people walking on Mars. We'd have people around Venus. Uh, some of you may have seen the story that just came out yesterday about Europa, a very exciting uh, series of photographs, but no people are out there. And that's because as far as we've gotten with people in space happened in 1969 and in the few years after. So why did that happen, aside from the political issues? And I'll just mention that, unfortunately, democracy, although I'm strongly in favor of it uh, for just about all things, is not a very reliable platform for lifting us off this planet. Because when you have people in Congress constantly bickering about funding, obviously, space travel can suffer. And in addition to that, the Cold War uh, was over by 1990. And even before then, since we had gotten to the moon already, we'd beaten the Soviets, that motive was gone. Well, there was a, and still is, a scientific motive, right? We want to get as much knowledge as possible. Space is an exciting way to get knowledge. But alas, most people are not motivated 
to get knowledge in the same way as they are to, say, have superiority over the Soviet Union. So although science continues to be an important motivating factor, I would consider it a weak motivation. And not to cast aspersions against science and knowledge, but I'm saying just from the point of view of almost propaganda, it's very hard to motivate people when you're appealing to their interest in don't you want more scientific knowledge. NASA has tried over the years to say, well, hey, you know, this, something that we discovered in space can help us here. But for the most part, that has not uh, ignited any real passion for space. More recently, there's been a third motive, the commercial motive. Everybody wants to make a buck. Money is good. I certainly think money is good. <laughs> and the commercial motive has had some success. Unfortunately, the SpaceX program has had mixed success, but it's had some success. Richard Branson, billionaires have put some money into these programs. But nonetheless, I don't see a fleet of ships going out beyond the solar system. I don't see any attempt at interstellar travel at all. You know, there's a lot of interesting speculation. Uh, Stephen Hawking has suggested uh, with other people maybe we should send the little uh, chips from here to the Alpha Centauri system. That's a good idea, but what about people? And so having thought about this for a while, I finally wrote something about it in 2002, a book called Real Space on the fate of physical presence in the digital age on and off planet. And what's most pertinent to what we're talking about here is the off planet part of it. And I think that, uh, you know, with all due respects to robots, one of the chapters in that book was entitled, Real Robots Don't Cry. <laughs> we need people out there. We need the poetry of people. But thinking about this more, I realized that there was a very big and almost totally unexplored and untapped realm, which in many ways might provide the best motivation for getting off this planet and getting out there into the cosmos. I think it's the motivation that every sentient being has. Every person, and for all I know, dolphins, but we can't communicate with them all that well. But certainly every human being has wondered many, many times what am I doing here in this world? What are we doing here? You look up at the sky, you see the stars. What's the meaning of all this? And science tries in its way to give us some answers, but science doesn't even begin to scratch the deepest parts of that question. And that brings me eventually to what we're talking about on this panel, because there has been a mode of human discourse, a mode of human community, a mode of human cognition, as old, as far as we know, as the human species itself, which does address those issues. And that is religion, organized religion and unorganized religion. Now, religion has received, uh, you know, a sometimes justified, sometimes not justified rap as being uh, opposed to science and knowledge. Certainly, the Catholic Church didn't help much when they persecuted Galileo, but they did apologize a couple of years ago. <laughs> Better late than never. 
But that doesn't really matter, because it doesn't matter what religion has done wrong. What matters is what religion has done right, which is to address this issue in its own flawed way, because all human endeavors are flawed. And so I realize that religion may be the missing necessary engine for space travel. And I gave a talk like this, much like this, a few years ago. And also sitting at the table with me is Michael, and was Michael. You'll hear from him soon. And we began talking after that panel. Uh, and we began saying, hey, you know, we should take this idea of the interrelationship of space travel and religion a little further than just talking about it at conferences. And so that's how this book, Touching the Face of the Cosmos, on the intersection of space travel and religion, was born. And, um, you know, we did it uh, the way I, and it turns out Michael, you know, do most things by the seats of our pants. And I basically thought early on, hey, in addition to having essays, why not have some science fiction stories in there? And I was delighted to get actually a science fiction story from James. Uh, and an essay from my colleague at Fordham, Professor Strait. An essay from the Pope's astronomer, Guy Consolmagno, who also uh, wants to apologize on behalf of Cardinal Bellarmine and all those people uh, in the early 1500s, 1600s. Uh, but he wrote a very uh, good essay. I was able to interview John Glenn, who, by the way, is sharp as a whip. This was just this past July. Uh, and he had some interesting thoughts to say about this. So uh, what I'm hoping will happen, and really the reason why I'm here, is to get more people to look into this avenue. Because I truly believe that it doesn't even matter which religion it is. It can be any religion. It should be all religions. Again, it could be a non-organized religion. It could be a highly organized religion. But any part of human culture which is already looking at this fundamental question of who am I? What am I doing here? What is my relationship to the cosmos that got Blaise Pascal to basically be in awe, I'm so tiny in relation to this immensity? Any part of human culture that looks at that is an intrinsic supporter, ally, and champion of space travel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levinson.